Okay, so I would like to start. Uh, welcome uh, everybody or welcome back to this Poema uh, Learning Weeks. So we are continuing the course by Professor Cordian Riner on the symmetry, symmetry questions in the algebraic uh, geometry. And today he will speak to us about symmetries and polymerization problems. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to ask questions, please ask them in the chat box. Or if, if you want to make comments and share some insights in the chat box, that's also very nice. It's good to have a lively discussion. So without further ado, I would uh, be very happy to give the word to Cordia. Yes, thank you, Etienne, and thank you, everybody, for being here. I don't know uh, what the weather is for you. For me, it's absolutely sunshine today, almost absolutely sunshine. So um, I think I can value highly that you are here and uh, decided to uh, come to this course. So today, I want to continue to some extent what we started last week. There will be a minimal overlap, maybe, but it's it actually should give a new perspective of the question of how to deal with symmetries and algorithmic questions in real algebraic geometry. And today I will focus on polynomial optimization, POPs. Okay. Um, so what this talk will be about is um, will be a general overview uh, of the basic ideas, and I, I'll stress this here. It's more to give the ideas and to give the, um, the tools and the, the references in the literature to, to, for you to actually explore yourself, how you can use symmetries in polynomial optimization problems to reduce and simplify the optimization problems. And in particular, the first, more than half of the first uh, of this talk, uh, the first half will be essentially uh, using representation theory, but with a focus on invariant theory to simplify sums of squares relaxations of polynomial optimization problems, which you're all aware and which you all, to some extent, have already heard a lot about uh, uh, the sum of squares relaxations. And uh, then I will also shortly outline some ideas uh, of different approaches to, to that will in our setup be specifically for symmetric polynomial optimization problems. So optimization problems that are invariant by the symmetric group. Okay, and throughout this talk, again, G will be a finite group, which will act on the real vector space by a linear representation. And again, some of the results go over to more general groups, but uh, this is maybe something for the discussion afterwards. And, um, so last week, we have already seen how we can, in the setup of representation theory, use Schur's lemma to simplify SDPs. And if you know a little bit about sums of squares, then you know that sums of squares are essentially given by SDPs. So you already know, maybe only by being, having been here last week, that uh, you can simplify this question with the sums of uh, with the semi-definite programming tools that we saw last week. But today I want to focus really only on this sums of squares calculations um, uh, side of it. Okay, so let us begin with some small definitions that I will be using again throughout the talk. Um, so I have a group and we look at a representation of that group. So this is again a group homomorphism that takes the group and maps it into the general linear group over R. Uh, so it gives me, if we choose basis, it gives me for every group element, it gives me a matrix that lets the group act on Rn. And I can then, because I have this action on Rn, also define an action on polynomials by just saying, well, I evaluate the polynomials uh, as functions. I evaluate them not at X, but I have the group uh, representation acting on X, and uh, I can define this, I will denote this F up G, which is this action of G on the polynomials. Okay, and then very easy notation again, I, I will say that a polynomial is invariant if acting by the group on the polynomial doesn't change the polynomial. And um, also a standard notation that you have seen maybe already previously, I will use the polynomial ring up to the G to denote the ring of invariant polynomials. And another important tool that we have already seen last week to some extent 
which I also will be using is the Reynolds operator. So this is a, um, a line, this is a map that takes a polynomial and gives me an invariant polynomial. And it's defined for finite groups just by taking the weighted average over the group action on a given polynomial. Okay? So this is the sum divided by the group over the actions of the group on the polynomial. So there's two small exercises that you might want to do if you're not familiar with that. And the first one is to actually show that set of polynomials that are invariant with respect to a finite group, they have a more structure than just a subset. They're actually a ring. And moreover, that the map the, that we get by the Reynolds operator is in fact an inver is linear in the invariant ring. So that means that whenever I multiply with an invariant polynomial, I can just take this out of the Reynolds operator. So both things are kind of easy to do. It's more or less calculations, but I, if you've never seen this, it might be very helpful for you. Okay, so what do we mean by a symmetric polynomial optimization problem? So suppose I have polynomials f, g1 to gg, a gk, and they are polynomials, and I look at a set k, a semi algebraic set k, defined by, the, by inequalities g of 1 equals uh, greater or equals to 0, gk greater or equals to 0. So all the x that satisfy the linear inequal, uh, not the linear, the polynomial inequalities given by the gi. And then we have already seen this, a polynomial optimization problem is just minimizing the function f subject to all x's in k. And um, we will say that such a problem is invariant if k, the semi-algebraic k set k, is closed by the action of the group. So that means whenever I take an element, a point in k, then also its complete orbit should be in k. So whenever I have a group acting on the point x in k, also its image should be in k for all elements in the group. And the function f, our objective function, should be g invariant. That's kind of a, a, a specific notation and you might want to consider hard, more strict, not, uh, strict conditions. For example, you could want that the GIs are themselves all invariant polynomials, which at the end you can think about is not too much a problem uh, and not uh, too much more general. Our definition is not much more general than that one. Okay. And why, I mean, so this is, this is a very interesting problem, of course, many problems that, uh, that arise, in particular also in combinatorial optimization, actually, are of the form that they are polynomial optimization problems that have symmetries. So, if, for example, if you take a, a symmetric polynomial and you minimize it or maximize it over the, the hypercube, these kind of things are um, symmetric polynomial optimization problems in our setup. And the problem with those things actually is, and if you have been here last week, this might be a good reminder to the picture that I showed in the beginning. The interesting thing is that the symmetry on the one hand makes the picture very nice, but it also makes it very complicated if you recall that, and that's exactly the same in the set of polynomial optimization problems. Actually, our polynomial optimization problem might have much more minimizers due to this symmetry, because whenever I have a minimizer due to the setup, also its whole orbit under the group will be a minimizer. And so I might have many, many, many uh, minimizers or maximizers, uh, but actually up to symmetry, they might be reduced to something, to a smaller amount of symmetrizers. And this, I mean, this is now a very vague statement that we will make this a little bit more, cl uh, more clearer through the talk. This can be actually very beneficial um, to reduce the symmetry, essentially to reduce, for example, this number of minimizers to reduce the number of, of solutions that you have to calculate in the end. Okay, and for this talk, I will uniquely now for the beginning focus on global minima of invariant functions and essentially relaxing this problem via sums of squares. Okay, and so I, I've, I've thought a little bit about how I should present this to you uh, in a way that it actually doesn't require a lot of notation and it doesn't require a lot of uh, 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 calculations. 
And I found for myself that actually one can understand a lot by the following very, very easy example that I will do now in a little bit more detail and that we then later want to generalize a little bit. So, and the example is with this more or less non-trivial group. So we just take the group S2 that permutes to uh, um, acts on R2 by symmetrizing uh, X and Y. And we want to understand S2 invariant sum of square polynomials. Okay? And in order to arrive at a, at a statement, we will actually be using only some, I think, known facts. So some facts that you might have already seen. And uh, if not, I can invite you to, to think about them. Um, so the first one is, and um, um, so this is a little bit awkward because now we have n variables, but S2 acting, this should be only x1 and x2, I guess. So I have a polynomial that is in two variables that is invariant by the symmetric group here. Then we know that it can be uniquely written as a polynomial f tilde in two polynomials p1 and pi1 and pi2, which are exactly the sums of powers of x1 and x2. Okay. And the second statement fact that we will be using is whenever I have a polynomial that is not necessarily a symmetric polynomial, any polynomial, again, in two variables only, can be uniquely written as P1 plus P2 times X minus Y, where P1 and P2 are S2 invariant polynomials. Okay? So this is, of course, a very, very general, uh, very, very particular situation we are looking at. But we will see later how exactly those two facts generalize to a much uh, more general situation. Okay. So let's, let's look at our polynomial f and let's assume that f is a sum of squares. So that f can be written as f1 squared plus 2fk squared. And f is supposed to be S2 invariant. Okay? So the first thing one might be tempted to hope for is, of course, that actually because f is invariant, all the fi's themselves are already invariant. Uh, oh, I have a very good question. I will come to that in a minute. So the invariants are... Um, uh, so so the one example that you can think of, if you take a polynomial of degree 2, in two variables, that is a sum of squares. And one thing that might come into your mind is exactly the polynomial x plus x squared plus y squared, which is a sum of squares. However, I mean, the individual polynomials that we square, they are not themselves invariant by the symmetric group S2. And now you can sit down and work this a little bit, but I mean, it should be more or less clear. That there is, in fact, no way of writing x squared plus y squared as a sum of polynomials fi that are themselves invariant. Okay, so, so the first naive approach does of course not work, but let's try to use our property B that we established. So by the property B, we know that these fi's, they are of the form fi1 plus fi2 times x minus y, where these f i1 and fi2 actually are uh, invariant polynomials. So if I square the polynomial fi, well, this is an easy exercise again, this is nothing more than the binomial, uh, binomial formula, I get this, um, I, get, uh, I get this form here. So it's fi1 f squared plus f12 squared minus x minus y squared. And I have, I have these mixed terms in the middle. Note, however, that when I look at x minus y and I square it, this is in fact an invariant polynomial because it doesn't matter when I interchange y and x, I still get the same polynomial all the time. So when I plug this together to my f, I just get that I have f is the sum of the F, uh, F1s here, to the first ones here, plus 
some mixed terms in the middle that I have to value by x by y minus x, some plus some other squares in the end that are weighted with x minus y squared. Okay, very interesting. So note that all these coefficients, I call them now coefficients, they are themselves polynomials, but I call them coefficients now. Those coefficients, they are themselves invariant polynomials. Yes, that's all just property B. Now we will just need to use that F is in fact symmetric. So what does it mean that it's symmetric? It means F of X and Y is exactly the same as F and Y of X. So when I take my polynomial, I take one half X, uh, F of X, Y plus one half Y, X, I get back the same polynomial because it's the same. However, you see in the middle that exactly those terms, because I will get a minus in here, will vanish when I sum them up. So we see that those mixed terms can be actually, actually cancelled. And in the end, what I get is just I can write as a sum of squares of these polynomials here. They are all invariant plus some sums of squares here, sums of squares of invariant polynomials times x minus y squared. Yes. Um, so now all the polynomials that you see here, they are all themselves invariant. This is invariant, this is invariant, but also we agreed that this uh, squared of the difference is, is uh, invariant. So they are all invariant. So I can write them again as polynomials in P1 and P2. And what this amounts to actually is that we have shown the following. So if ever I have a polynomial F in X and Y, and I look at its polynomial in the piece, so the polynomial tilde f that I get in the p1 and p2, that I get from fact number a, then f is a sum of squares, if and only if, or if it is a sum of squares, then we have the decomposition of the form for f tilde of the form f tilde equals sigma 1 plus 2 pi one, 2 minus pi 1 squared. So this is exactly the, 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 the expression of x minus y squared in the pi 1 and pi 2 times sigma 2, where sigma 1 and sigma 2, they are polynomials that are invariant. So they, are, they live in the, in the ring generated by pi 1 and pi 2, but they are in fact actually sums of squares of elements in this ring. So they are sums of squares of S2 invariant polynomials. So this might have been, a, I mean, I hope this hasn't been too quick. Um, it has been a little bit uh, uh, in, instructive, but what I would like you to do after the talk, if you have time and if you want to look at this, to understand a little bit why this representation is actually beneficial is to see how this actually can be used to simplify the calculations. Remember, we know that a sum of squares can be, I mean, checking if a polynomial can be, uh, is a sum of squares, can be translated into a semi-definite program. And now we can translate our problem of the sum of squareness of F into a problem of a condition on my F tilde, which I can also write down with sum of squares matrices. However, now the sum of square matrices they are, they are indexed by, by my variables pi1 and pi2. And uh, now an essential part of this calculation is that pi1 is just uh, the sum of the axis, so it has degree 1, but pi2 is a sum of, uh, of squares, so it has a degree 2. And now if you start with a polynomial of degree 4 and you try to write down these conditions here, you will actually see a quantitative difference when you write down the semi-definite program that you would have to, to, to calculate in order to establish this condition of f prime with respect to f. Okay, so I have just one question here that I got um, in the chat and let me just answer this because I can, I think, answer it um, directly by saying it's not that easy a priori, I guess. So, uh, um, 
So this is, if you have a basic closed semi-algebraic set uh, that is invariant by a group, then one knows, for example, by a group action, then one knows, for example, that one can always represent it by invariant polynomials. There's an easy algorithm to do that, which is essentially take all the polynomials, take all the orbits of the polynomials, and then build new polynomials that are non-negative if and only if the original polynomials are non-negative. And then you could just write down these, um, these invariant, I mean, just assuming that your set is invariant, you would then try to use this algorithm to come up with a semi-algebraic set description for your semi-algebraic set, but this then cannot be your originally semi-algebraic set, so you would run out in a contradiction. This is not very easy, and I'm actually not sure if there is an easy way to check if a semi-algebraic set is closed by the action of a group. Um, but uh, if anybody has good insights to that question, please feel free to share this. Um, is the theorem clear to that extent? Are there questions to that theorem? Was it too easy? Again, it's very hard for me to know what people are doing and thinking, so um, let me just go on slowly. So now we want to see how we can actually generalize this result to a more general situation, where instead of just a very trivial group S2, we have a more interesting group, namely the symmetric group Sn, acting on Rn, and acting in a way that we have a linear representation that is just giving us the permutation of the standard basis. Okay, so um, there's again two facts that generalize the previous facts that I want to mention. So again, we look at the ring of invariance. So in the last situation, in the situation of S2, we saw that this is generated by two polynomials. Now we'll find, and I think this is also quite generally known, it is generated by n algebraically independent homogeneous polynomials Pj, with degree being uh, j, not k, sorry, the degree of them is j, of course. And one example of such a family of polynomials is essentially the ones that we had before. You take the Newton sums. So you take the sum over the axis, where you take the powers to be y, and this is your polynomial pi, uh, pi j, uh, the power to be j, and this is your polynomial pi j. Okay, so this generalizes. This is one to one, essentially the same uh, the same statement that we had previously about the invariant ring. So instead of two homogeneous polynomials, we have n homogeneous polynomials, and they are algebraically independent. That means that we can actually find a unique represent, representation of our polynomial. Yes, Giorgio, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Yes, very good, so a very good remark. And the next important algebraic statement is that the polynomial ring is in fact a module over the invariant ring. What does it mean to be a module? I mean, it means that we can multiply with, the, with, with polynomials, of course, um, with symmetric polynomials, and we get again a polynomial. That's not so surprising, but it is a free module of finite rank n factorial. So let, let me, I mean, if, if you don't feel comfortable with this notation, let me just break this down a little bit. So the above theorem essentially tells us A again, that every symmetric polynomial f can be uniquely written as a polynomial f tilde, again, in the pjs. And again, note that the degree of the pjs now might be even bigger than two, Hence, this reduces the degree of f tilde a priori, possibly, with respect to f. Uh, so, for example, my, my polynomial P, pj, this is also an invariant polynomial, of course, and if I represent pj in terms of the pi's, then, of course, this is just a linear polynomial. And the second interesting thing, which is, which is the translation of, uh, of statement b, is that we can actually find a family of polynomials B1 to be n factorial, so it's many polynomials, but that generalizes our statement from previously such that every polynomial P that is not necessarily symmetric can be uniquely written again as a linear combination 
linear combination with the coefficients in the invariant ring of those polynomials. So every polynomial P can be uniquely written once I fixed B1 to Bn, it's uniquely be writable as pi 1 B1 plus pi 2 B2 and so on to pi n factorial B n factorial. So this is a huge, I mean, essentially, it's, you can think of this, I mean, if you don't, if you're not familiar with modules, you can really think if this were a field, then this would be a vector space over the field. Okay, so let us now try to do exactly the same thing that, we done, that we've done previously. Let us use property B in a convenient way. So again, let's write P in this form. And then if I just look, then P squared I mean, is, uh, is of that form. So I have all the squares here, but then I also have these, these mixed terms in the middle. And now let's try to, this is now just a, a very convenient way of writing this down. And this might be a little bit confusing in the beginning, but just uh, try to, to, to bear a little bit. So I just define two polynomials, uh, two matrices, actually matrix polynomials of size n factorial times n factorial, um, where I take P, uh, I just take all the P's in a, in a, in a row vector, I transpose it, uh, multiply it with, uh, with the same vector again. So this gives me an n factorial times n factorial matrix, where on the position ij, I exactly have the product pi times pj. And I do the same with the matrix B. And then I can also write the above statement just by saying I take the trace of the product of the two matrices A and B. Okay. Um, and then more generally, of course, I can, I assume that F is a sum of squares. So then, um, then the interesting thing is now that the, I, I just have every time this factor B in this thing, and I can th those accordingly define define the sum of squares uh, as the sum of these polynomials PI times the matrix B that I defined with my basis B. So this gives us an intermediate result, which actually is, uh, is, is, is looks a little bit horrible the way I write it down, but just bear with me a little bit. It's just about the matrices, the basis that we fixed. So whenever I have a polynomial, actually at this point, it doesn't necessarily need to be invariant. Let me stress this maybe. Then I can find the matrix polynomial A, can find the matrix polynomial A, which is the sum of these rank one matrix polynomial sums of squares. Um, so this is what I call a sum of square matrix polynomial. It's just a polynomial that I created in this way, a matrix that I created in this way. Um, such that uh, actually my polynomial F can be written as the trace product of the matrix A times the matrix P, not B. Sorry, this should be P, I guess. No, B, B, it's B. A is the sum of them and B is the matrix that we got from above. Okay, so this is just linear algebra, nothing, nothing important done here. But now we have to see what can we actually do with, uh, with the symmetry. Of, of our situation. So now I will denote sim n, essentially the Reynolds operator with respect to the symmetric group. And this is sometimes just the symmetrization operation. So again, this is nothing but averaging over the group action. And now if a polynomial is symmetric, this just means that symmetrizing it doesn't change it. Yeah, that's what it means to be a symmetrization. And thus, I can use the symmetrization in the sums of squares decomposition. So I have F has this form. I can take the symmetrization in front and I can take the symmetrization inside because AI is invariant by definition. And, um, and uh, we, we, we established or you established in the exercises that symmetrization is linear with respect to the invariant ring. So, and here I mean by sim n of b, I just mean a symmetrization component bias. So again, I get a matrix at the end, which I denote b tilde, all of which entries are matrices, uh, are polynomials, and those polynomials are now invariant. And using fact a, I just know I can write every one of these entries as polynomials in the p1 to pn. Thus, in the end, I get a matrix polynomial. Um, in the variables pi one to pi. Okay. Note, however, at this at this stage, the matrix polynomial is still very very big. It's n factorial times n factorial, 
So it wouldn't be much fun to work with those. Okay. So now let's just do a small intermezzo from last week to remind us of the Schur's lemma. So uh, for Schur's lemma, we, we, we looked at representations. So I have this I have this action of G on the linear vector space Rn. And this, of course, induces an action on the polynomial ring. So the polynomial ring essentially also has a G module structure in the, in the language we used last week. And just as a small warning, uh, which you shouldn't be frightened too much. Last week, I defined this only for finite dimensional vector spaces. And now this is in fact an infinite dimensional vector space, but that's not a big problem. For example, I mean, because our group action is linear, the group action will respect all the, uh, will, will respect the grading that we have by degree, for example. And uh, now we can look at only, uh, we can first of all, take a decomposition with respect to the, 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 the grading and uh, then the group action, all of those things will be closed by the group action. So they will be, the homogeneous parts will be um, G modules of their own right. And we now can, by, by, by Maschke's lemma, we saw last week that each of them now decomposes into irreducibles. And summing this up, we actually get that we have a, a finite list of pairwisely distinct irreducible characters of my group G, which I now call chi, chi 1 to chi L. And then that our invariant, our polynomial ring, just decomposes as a direct sum of those irreducible, um, irre, of irreducible representations. Those are in fact many, um, I mean, here we have many potentially inside. So this is all of them are infinite dimensional vector spaces. And by R x1 to xn sub chi i, I just mean those are the so-called isotypic components of the polynomial ring with respect to the, the character chi i. So these are um, all G modules that only contain G modules isomorphic to the irreducible representation. KL. So this is a horrible slide, I agree. It's a lot of notation to digest. If you have paid attention last week, very good for you. If you know about representation theory, this was a piece of cake. If you feel uncomfortable with that, don't worry too much. Um, but remember that we had this very interesting direct consequences of Schur's lemma. Namely, we, we had that irreducible representations that are non-isomorphic cannot be mapped onto each other with an invariant uh, homomorphism. And essentially what you get from this by applying this to the situation that I described upstairs is that essentially if you have two polynomials F1 and F2 that are from two distinct isotypic components, then when I take the product of them and I symmetrize this product, this has to be zero. Okay, so the sketch of the proof is just, I mean, we assume that they are from two distinct irreducible representations. And the trick is now we use them to define a G homomorphism between those two irreducible, uh, those two non-isomorphic irreducible representations that they are. Um, this is done in this way. It's just, again, using the symmetrization and one has to show that this is in fact an SN homomorphism, but then we know from Schur's lemma that this has to be identical zero, meaning that this coefficient here has to vanish for all of them. Okay, um, so this was again a little bit harsh and a little bit, uh, um, a little bit uh, maybe throwing you into cold water, but I, it's, it's really a direct consequence of Schur's lemma and I would like to ask you to work out the details of this statement really uh, in the general case of a finite group, where instead of symmetrization, you use the Reynolds operator. Okay, so this is essentially, I mean, if you, if you are not comfortable with that, so let's just come to the next statement because this might ring the bell from last week. We have seen that Schur's lemma guarantees us that we have a very nice basis. Okay, we can find very nice spaces. 
And now I just, just to work with vector spaces, I, I, I denote V, curly V, the vector space, the R vector space generated by the polynomials P1 to Pn. So uh, Pn factorial, Pn factorial. So this is in fact, again, I mean, the group acts on those P1 to Bn. So it acts on this vector space here. And this vector space is again a G module. Okay. For the experts in the audience, this the, the representation that you get here is essentially isomorphic to the regular representation of the symmetric group. But that's not important. All that you need to remember is that by Schur's lemma, we know that we can find a nice symmetry adapted basis that might just fall from the sky that you found in a book that you calculated yourself, that your advisor gave you. Nobody knows where you got it. But once you have it, so this is the B tilde, uh, once you have it, we know that this matrix that we defined here will be essentially block diagonal. So we will get the matrix B tilde, which is a matrix polynomial, actually, um, will be block diagonal. So it will be the direct sum over exactly so many uh, smaller matrices, matrix polynomials, how, uh, corresponding to the number of irreducible representations that I have in my group. And the block sizes, we also saw this last week, they are essentially, essentially determined by the number of occurrences of multiplicities of the irreducible representations that I look at in this vector space V. So this can be all computed ahead or because I just uh, spoiled it a little bit and said that this is the, this is in fact a regular representation, you can actually calculate this quite easily. So what does this give us in the end? It gives us a beautiful theorem, essentially tells us if I have a polynomial that is in the variables x1 to xn, that is invariant and is a sum of squares, and I take the polynomial f tilde in the generators of my invariant ring, pi1 to pi n, uh, then I can translate the fact that f is a sum of squares into a condition of onto p tilde, an algebraic condition of the p tilde, with, with essentially now is the same that we had the previous slide, but now I just use this block diagonalization of my matrix B. So I get the sum over the i's. Uh, now the traces of these polynomial matrix polynomials AI and B chi i. So they are matrix polynomials. Those are the ones, the B chi i's are the ones that we calculated with our basis that we got for free or maybe one in the lottery. And each of the I, AI's has to be a matrix sum of squares polynomial of invariant polynomials. So again, let me say what this means is each of the AIs is a sum of matrices uh, of the rank one matrices that you get by just taking invariant polynomials uh, and, and, and squaring them as vectors. Okay. So this is essentially a very beautiful theorem, but um, um, but you, you might ask, what is the gain that I get? I mean, the gain of this, part, this theorem is not at first visible. But um, essentially, keep in mind that we started with a polynomial f, and the polynomial f has a degree, and the polynomial f tilde has a degree. And because, um, because we, we, we interchange the axes with the pi's, the degree of f tilde might be considerably smaller than the degree of f. Hence, the sum of squares polynomial matrices that we have to consider in the invariant ring are much smaller. And let me just give you one example of that. And this is, uh, uh, this is the only concrete example maybe that you will see today. Uh, on, on that spaces, but let me just calculate those matrices for quartic polynomials. Okay, so for quartic polynomials, actually, I claim that I only need those two matrix polynomials. Um, I claim this because of the degree, but um, so I only need the ma matrix polynomial B1, which is the symmetrization of these squares here. Yes. 
So my bi's are essentially x n minus x one and x n squared minus x uh, x n squared minus x one squared, and then I have here the cross products. I symmetrize this. This gives my matrix one, and I have this other polynomial, which is essentially just a polynomial. It's a it's a polynomial matrix of of size one times one, where I take where I take the squares of this polynomial. Okay, so what what we what we get by by using all of these techniques is that uh, whenever I have a polynomial in more than three variables, that's a small side note here, but this we need to actually define this one here, um, a homogeneous polynomial of degree four, then f is the sum of squares, if and only if f tilde can be written in the following very very nice form. So let me just tell you this very, very nice form again. So I have one sigma zero. Sigma zero is supposed to be an honest sum of squares of symmetric polynomials. So it's a sum of squares in the variables pi one to pi n. Um, and because of the degree, because f is supposed to have degree four, f tilde cannot have degree more than four. So actually the polynomials that can occur in this, in this sigma are all of degree at most two. Yeah. Uh, then we have the matrix polynomial. So these are two times two matrices, matrix polynomials that we multiply, we take the trace of them. And then we have a, a last factor. Again, we have this symmetrization here and I can just multiply it with a positive constant. Okay. So the sizes of the matrix polynomial, and when, you, when you look at this theorem again, the sizes of the matrix polynomial in this theorem are actually independent on n. Uh, and those matrices can be actually also efficiently calculated. The way we calculated these matrices is just, I mean, one has to compute these symmetrizations, but since those small factors here, they are invariant by a huge subgroup of Sn, this can be essentially done by hand. Yeah? And uh, so, and once you have them, maybe parametrically with the parameter n, you actually get a way of checking that a symmetric polynomial of degree four in a number of variables n that you don't necessarily need to specify ahead of time is a sum of squares. So in particular, the complexity of checking if a symmetric quartic polynomial is a sum of squares is independent of n. Okay? And actually this fact is more generally true. So whenever you have a symmetric polynomial, its degree 2D, uh, whenever n is bigger than 2D, the number of variables in the sum of squares, uh, um, then the, the complexity of, uh, of checking if the polynomial is a sum of squares is independent of n because you can just write down an algebraic identity that is of a fixed degree in the polynomials p1 to pn. So some words to the proof of that and the proof is, is, is essentially doing exactly what we did before. It is, is essentially relies on the uniqueness of the representations in terms of the pi's and a nice module basis for this invariant ring. And there one can use the so-called higher special polynomials, for example. And uh, yes, some coefficients might depend on n. Yes, that's true. Um, but that's what I mean. So, I mean, that's, that's maybe a little bit, I mean, maybe I, I should have been a little bit more precise. Maybe the complexity in a sense of an algebraic identity checking, yes. But uh, if you want to solve this with a numerical solver, then indeed, I mean, the, this n might turn very big or very small, and then it's a little bit. Uh, um, and another question that I get here, sorry for, this is not, it's, it's, it's related to them. So the normal spec polynomials, they are higher spec polynomials, but higher spec polynomials are a, are a bigger family. Uh, we can we can take we can can discuss this a little bit offline maybe if you want to. Okay, so the good news is that um, that this all um, as easy as I try to represent it in this easy case, 
actually all generalizes to all finite groups. So whenever I have a finite group acting linearly on Rn, then the invariant ring is again a ring, it's a ring of polynomials, it's generated by m homogeneous polynomials, but the price we have to pay for a general group is that this representation is in general not unique, meaning that the generators are themselves not necessarily algebraically independent. And again, the polynomial ring is a module of finite rank even, but it's not necessarily a free module, meaning the representation that we took with the coefficients being invariant polynomials will not be unique for a given polynomial. However, um, with this statement that we don't prove here, all the things that I just generally tried to explain, the general setup that we used to work with symmetric sums of squares generalizes directly. Um, one has to, I mean, one has to define those matrices in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a similar way, again, using the Reynolds operator for the various characters. And then the representation in terms of the PI can be obtained, but of course you have to you have much more variables then, and you have to keep maybe track of the algebraic dependencies amongst those polynomials. Okay, so this was the first part of the talk a little bit, and um, I know that this was maybe a little bit much for people who have never really thought about this, and maybe a little bit too easy for the people who have already thought about this. But let me just try to give you a take-home message of this first part. And the take-home message is that essentially using the tools from representation theory that we have already seen last week, and in fact, one could completely forgot, forget about invariant theory and just use exactly the same techniques just with the matrices that we have when I represent a symmetric, uh, when I represent an invariant sum of squares with matrices. This is, would be essentially the same thing one would get. Um, and but then using also invariant theory, the SOS relaxation of uh, polynomial optimization can be drastically simplified. Okay. However, um, this is a, a rather positive statement. However, I, mean, I want you to keep in mind that essentially um, we just simplified the calculations. What do I do mean by this? So essentially, by reducing from the from the axis to the pi's, as I told you, we, we reduce the degree. We make calculations possible that maybe were not possible before. We block diagonalize certain matrices um, and then can actually enter them into an STP solver and before that we were maybe not able to do that. So we can actually do relaxations maybe that we couldn't do before. However, they do not change the relaxation in a fundamental matter. By this I mean we are not able to improve the quality of a given SOS relaxation. So we are maybe able to compute it easily because it reduces, for example, to a linear program, but we cannot actually say anything more than just calculating this value. So this is why, I, I mean, this is, I think this is something that is very important. Um, and I want to show you one idea how one could essentially also do something. So suppose you have a polynomial optimization problem again, um, and it is invariant or maybe only a priori, a priori, somebody told you that the solution of the problem that you're actually looking at is obtained at an invariant, I mean, a symmetric point. Okay, and I don't know if this question rings a bell for you, this scenario, but uh, at least for me in uh, ninth or 10th grade, this was an, a, a problem that appeared in several tests uh, in mathematics, which was the question, uh, given the circumeter of a, of a garden, uh, somebody, wants to, somebody has so and so many meters of uh, fence and wants to uh, get the garden of the biggest uh, area. Yeah? So how does you do this? And in, in the school, you then learn that the, the optimal solution is obtained at the square, so when both side lengths of the, of the fence are equal. So 
Um, so what does one do in such a case? So the direct solution of this is, of course, to restrict my polynomial optimization problem to only the invariant solutions. Yeah? So in particular, in the case of the symmetric group, we would then reduce our polynomial optimization problem to a polynomial optimization problem in just one variable, because essentially there's just one ray of invariant solutions, namely uh, one, 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 one times lambda. Okay, so essentially it turns out that if the feasible region of a gene variant polynomial optimization problem is convex and the objective function is convex, then of course the solution of the pop can be found amongst the g invariant points. So this is maybe a small homework for you to actually prove this statement. It's not really hard, but you have seen this already last week in some disguise in a more general setting of convex optimization. So if I have a meaning if I have a convex symmetric optimization problem, I can solve it really easily because I only need to restrict to these invariant points. However, in general, when I'm not in the convex situation, the problem is that this is not in general true. So I want to show you some, some, some nice result in this direction that some of you maybe have already seen. So I look now, I mean, I can, I can ask myself, well, maybe I don't have to look at the fully symmetric point, but maybe some of the symmetry of my original problem may survive in the sense that it may be inherited to the optimal solution, even though my problem is not a priori convex. So I, I look at the, a set of points, AK in Rn, uh, uh, meaning the points that have at most K distinct coordinates. Okay, or another way of looking at those points is it's essentially the points that are stabilized by symmetric groups or who stabilizes this isomorphic um, uh, conjugate to direct products of symmetric groups, omega one as omega one to s omega k, where the omega one to omega k sum up to n. So it's all the points that are not necessarily maybe symmetric, but that still have a very huge group of symmetries. So now the theorem that I wanted to show you says the following. Suppose you have a symmetric optimization problem given by symmetric polynomials P and G1 to GM, where we have now restrictions on the, uh, on the, on the degrees. So I look at, um, so this should be a P here, sorry. So D should be the degree of, uh, of P. And I look uh, and I, I look at the maximum of the degrees of the inequalities that define K and half of the degree of my polynomial P. Then the statement says that my original optimization problem, so taking the infimum over all X in K is equivalent of only taking the infimum of P of K intersected with the set AK. So in some sense, I only have to look at this smaller dimensional um, problem. What do I mean by smaller dimensional? So, I mean, how do I actually realize this? Well, for every polynomial that is symmetric and every possible omega tuple omega i of omega one to omega k with the property that they sum up to n, we consider a new polynomial f, f omega uh, which is now a polynomial only in k variables t1 to tk, which I just obtained. This is very straightforward, of course, by setting the, the variables of my original problem to be equal. Okay. Um, so, of course, one gets that, uh, that the polynomial is, for example, non-negative. Yeah. So, all the gi's are now identical, um, one polynomials. If for all of these partitions that I get here, um, this polynom the polynomials that I get in fewer variables are non-negative. Or, I mean, I can also plug the same in for my semi-algebraic set K. So I define K omega. 
to be the T in R to the K, where the polynomials G1 to omega 1, so again, where I set variables to be equal, is greater or equal to zero. So this is now a semi-algebraic set living in RK. Let me say this again. And then we have obviously that the minimum of my original problem is nothing than I, I do the minimum over all possible ways of arranging these and then I do the minimum of the resulting polynomial optimization problems. But those polynomial optimization problems now essentially have fewer variables. And for example, one can then apply the same techniques that you all know, for example, the SOS moment techniques for every of these individual problems that I get in fewer variables. So now it seems a little bit odd that I replace one problem in many variables by potentially many, many, many problems in fewer variables. But one can, uh, one can see very quickly that essentially the number of problems that we have to look at in fewer variables is bounded by a polynomial in, uh, in uh, n for a fixed d. So it's, it's n, something n plus d to the d. So, but when we now fix our degree, then, uh, then essentially we have, uh, we have a polynomial number of problems that we need to look at. And um, so let me just mention, so this is a very nice way of dealing with problems sometimes because uh, it essentially can create examples where with this easy splitting technique that we, with, that we put up above, actually we increase the quality of the SOS relaxations. Namely, for example, if you look at this scenario, which is a little bit a cooked up scenario, of course, so I have polynomials P and G1 to GK, they are symmetric, and the polynomials GI are of the degree most K, and P is of degree at most 2K, but now the, the cooked up scenario is here when I assume that the variety that is given by G1 to GK has co-dimension K, yeah? and I have K polynomials, co-dimension K is, is, is likely that I have that, then essentially, um, then essentially each of those sets here, the varieties will be zero dimensional. So um, when I optimize over that with, with the, the standard Lasser relaxation, for example, I can have finite conversions of the problems. Okay, so, so this was just one flavor to show you another idea, and this has actually already been generalized a little bit to other groups also. So, for example, finite reflection groups and slightly less restrictive requirements on K, where you don't necessarily require that the K is given by symmetric polynomials. However, in general, it seems that this approach or the approach of essentially exploiting symmetry already before using um, any relaxation is, is really dependent from the actual situation. So the second take home message that I want you to uh, take home is that it sometimes can be beneficial to reduce symmetry already in the POP formulation, but that this is much more delicate and will essentially be dependent on your actual problem that you have at hand. So there are maybe even new ideas and techniques that might be really helpful in this regard. Okay, so before I close, let me just give you again some brief review over some literature. So again, the, the first of those, the first of those you have already seen, Gatteman and Parillo is a very good read if you really want to understand how symmetry works in semi-definite programming and what it has to do with sums of squares. Um, and then there's a bunch of other articles that you might want to read if you have specific interest, for example, in, in the relaxations for polynomial optimization or um, um, sum of squares moment problems in equivariant situation. In particular, if you're interested in understanding this um, symmetric business or so symmetric sum of squares, and no, um, then there's this article by Greg Blackerman and myself that might be interesting and related to the spec polynomials. There's hopefully soon this article by uh, ERS Sebastian and me that will, uh, will exploit this much more for so-called finite reflection groups. And, um, and also there's a dual side of that. The dual side uh, is the moment matrix. And there's a very nice paper by uh, Evelyn Hubert and uh, Mathieu Colloval 
that use sums of squares, uh, these this techniques of, of, of representation theory on the moment matrix to compute symmetric cubatures. Uh, and if you're interested in the other aspect of, uh, of invariant minimizers, there's a very beautiful article that I found very inspiring. It's somewhere from the 80s and it appeared in the mathematical Monsley and it's do symmetric problems have symmetric solutions. And it's, it's a very, it's, it's a long, I mean, it, it has a long history to tell about this problem and then actually also some, some very nice results. Uh, and if you're interested in particular in symmetric polynomials, there is this article by Timofte and there are certain other articles that actually explain how you prove this theorem with uh, symmetric polynomials and their minimizer. Okay, I just look at the quad at, and it's perfectly in time, I think, to at least uh, close with something that is very beautiful. So let me just close with that view that I had just on the weekend while hiking above Jumser. And I just did this to show you that I'm currently here. This is how it looks like outside. And uh, I'm actually very much looking forward to walking up here again. Thank you very much for your time and for hearing. So thank you very much, uh, Cordia. Uh, so I think we, we have plenty of time for questions still. So, so let's maybe just give everybody a chance to ask more questions. So, Korea, I can only uh, surmise that it was really clear. <laughs> um, maybe just a question for myself. Yes. Um, if you if you go back to the uh, uh, sum of squares of symmetric polynomial example, which one? The one of degree four, or uh, no, before that. Still back. Still back. Um, yeah, let me just see. Um, no, I, yeah. So yeah, it's a bit difficult. I don't have. I didn't notice note the slide. But I mean, in the end, you you have these polynomials uh, pi i appearing, which which are uh, symmetric. Yes. Um, and you, you, you mentioned a couple of examples, like the sum of the variables, um, and you said there are n of them, but yes. you, so can, can you just, by way of example, just um, uh, give all of them for one example? So, I mean, they are, I mean, essentially the, the polynomials pi, they are the sum of the variables to the power i, uh, to the power j. Okay. So the statement is a little bit more general. So the statement says that, so this, I mean, let me show you this, this theorem again. So this says that this ring of polynomials, this a ring, is generated by n algebraically independent homogeneous polynomials. And you have a lot of freedom of actually choosing those. So I see. they are not unique. And essentially the statement is that any algebraically independent, any family of algebraically independent homogeneous symmetric polynomials that have the right degree will actually work as, as those generators. But in particular, using the powers, the Newton sums is, is one version of doing that. Okay, no, I, I just misunderstood what you meant by for example, but now I understand. Okay. But, so, okay, so, so I do not see more questions arriving, Cordian, so I would... Is the symmetrization operator on all connected okay. close distance projection with respect to some scalar? Uh, yeah, oh. 
Oh, yes. It's a very good question because I have, oh, there's a, or oh, what's the complexity of computing the BI in general for a finite group? That's a very good question. Um, so, um, essentially the BIs, I mean, for, for computing these BIs, you first need to compute the small BIs, so the spaces. And for this basis, you actually, I mean, if you don't know them, and I basically had them fall from the sky, I mean, one way of doing this is using harmonic polynomials, or, uh, I mean, so G, G harmonic, so-called G harmonic polynomials, that's the way of doing it, or, I mean, so this linear algebra, uh, or, um, or Gripner basis. So, um, I mean, it's by no means uh, uh, easy, a priori, to do it. And the complexity, I unfortunately have no idea. But the good thing is, once you have calculated them, you can use them for every example that you then have of the class. So in some sense, they are a pre-computation that you need to do. And once you had this pre-computation done, you're, you're happy. And the uh, Corby's question is a little bit harder for me to know. Ah, is it some, it's, it's actually, it's an orthogonal, it's an orthogonal projection, yes. Ah. So you can actually define an inner product on the polynomials, essentially, that, uh, that has the property that, uh, that you, um, which you get essentially by these uh, harmonic polynomials. And, uh, and then it's essentially the orthogonal projection onto the invariant ring with respect to this inner product. I mean, I'm not, not sure if this is some Inuit in, intuitive, but... Uh... So again, let me say that I, I know that this was maybe a little bit uh, quicker than, than, uh, than I would do when people are in front of me and I look into people's eyes. That's always a little bit harder when you talk to yourself and you completely miss the point that actually there's people around you. If you have questions while reading the slides, please feel free to just send me an email and uh, we can take this via email or Skype. It's no problem. So uh, uh, currently we're having holidays here, so I'm mostly free. Cordian, I just see there's one more question oh. from Thorsten Meyer. Ah, Thorsten Meyer, okay. Uh, what's the advantage of using power sums instead of elementary symmetric polynomials? There is, mm, I mean, so for me now, when writing the slide, the, the advantage is that they are much more compact to write down. So when I wrote them into this, for example, it's much clearer what I mean by that. Um, they are, there's no real advantage and you could do all the computations I would think exactly in the same way we're using elementary symmetric polynomials or any other um, of those of those sets. I mean, the, the only advantage is maybe that they're very small in the sense that they're just a sum of n terms all the time. Ah, in the last part of the talk, the polynomials have fewer variables, but potentially much higher degree. No, they don't have, actually, they don't have... Uh, much higher degree. Let me let me go back, but it's a very good question, uh, Giorgio. They actually don't have higher degree, but essentially what you do is you inter. I mean, I mean maybe this is just it's just very confusingly written. What you do is you just intersect you intersect your space with with this linear hyperplane. So it's just intersecting your polynomials with a linear hyperplane. So the degree does not really go up. So you don't uh, take a, a higher degree. Okay. But again, if there's more questions, feel free to, to send them offline to me. No problem. I'm happy to answer. Okay, Kurian, so perhaps uh, this is a good uh, point to just close for today. People know how to find you if they have more questions. Yes. So just on behalf of all the participants, I would like to thank you for this very clear lecture. And we are looking forward to the last installment, uh, same time, same place next week. Same time, same place next week. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so thank you again and thank you everybody and uh, thank you everybody and enjoy the summer. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.